Monaco's brand new museum in Socho, eastern France, celebrates more than just cars because since 1810 the Peugeot family had been running a general manufacturing company making everything from sewing machines to coffee grinders. Now the odds are that this lady cyclist was wearing a Peugeot corset because the brothers made the steel inserts for those garments. They looked very much like bicycle spokes and of course the brothers started making bicycles themselves and that involved them in the embryonic car industry. This was one of their most famous bikes, it's the Grand B of 1882. Peugeot's first cars clearly showed their origins in the cycle and coachwork business. This 1892 vis-a-vis -vis had a meticulously detailed paint job and all the early models had a tubular chassis which also carried the cooling water. By the end of the 19th century, Peugeot were already demonstrating their reputation for durability by winning endurance races. In 1895, for instance, this Type 3 won a race from Paris all the way down to Bordeaux and then back again, averaging 13 and a half miles an hour. But by the turn of the century, the Surrey with a fringe on top look was already becoming dated and Peugeot were having to revise their ideas of always having the engine in the back to spare the passengers the fumes from the early engines. After 1901, a more elegant range of front-engine cars was developed, but their higher prices caused the family to split up. One brother, Robert, left to build cheaper cars under the Lion Badge in Lille. The basic but quite attractive Taurus weren't well liked, and the company wasn't a success. It took the development of a much-copied racing car, which caused a stir when it won at Indianapolis in 1916, and a Bugatti-designed cycle car, the Bebe, to bring the family back together. The Quadrilette of 1921 developed the cycle car theme further. Journeys in the Quadrilette were supposed to be cheaper than a third-class rail fare, but the width of only 1.2 metres meant a few compromises in seat comfort. But Peugeot's larger cars were sold not on their economy, but their toughness. It was in the 30s that Peugeot started the principle of calling their models after a three-digit number with a zero in the middle. The two and four series cars were particularly popular. This 1935 402 Peugeot is a perfect example that there's nothing new under the sun in the motor industry. Even in 1935 they were very concerned with aerodynamics and this car was actually styled with the assistance of a, a very primitive wind tunnel. One of the first things they discovered was the traditional place for headlamps out here on the wings caused an awful lot of air turbulence, so they moved them inside and put them under the radiator grill. And they carefully sculpted the side of the car so the air would flow over the front wings, and they filled in the traditional rear wheel arch as well, just to smooth the airflow through the whole car. Inside, it's truly luxurious with this enormous bench seat and because the gear change is up here on the dashboard like the Citroen Traxion there's no interruption to the passenger's feet and you can really squash up in comfort. Of course the French very concerned with ventilation forget your face level twist vents you actually open the windscreen like this and that I can assure you gave you a lovely rush of air on the route nationales. The company survived the recession and the 30s firmly established them as a mass car manufacturer. Although not as bold as Citroen, the improved fortunes left Peugeot with some room for adventurous experiments. The 1930s saw a passion for convertibles and it seemed that every saloon car had its ragtop equivalent. But the 402 Eclipse in 1935 literally stole the Paris show for the way that they converted this apparently solid saloon into a convertible. The whole back end hinged up and then the roof lifted on counterbalances and sunk down. Didn't leave you an awful lot of room for luggage, mind you, and you could even have it electrically operated. It was an idea that Ford were to take up in the mid-50s with their Skyliner. 
After the war, Peugeot produced a real winner. The 203 became one of the most popular cars of its time. It was joined by the 403 in 1955, the first Peugeot to be styled by Pininfarina, but it did little to remove the company's rather staid reputation. Rally victories had to wait for its successor, the 404. This example won the East African Safari in 1966 and 67, driven by the redoubtable Bert Shankland. And one other thing you could always rely on the tough old Peugeot to do, and that was to pull through the mud of the safari, but the navigator had to do a lot more than just sit inside and read the maps. He had to get on the back and bounce. Rallying has in fact been Peugeot's touchstone in their quest for a completely different image, and how they've succeeded in events like this, a record-breaking run up the fearsome American mountain track, Pikes Peak. Today, Peugeot's new factory in Sochaux produces the latest model, the 605 Executive Saloon. But the company hasn't forgotten its heritage and its roots. And it's nice to see their determination to ensure that every car in the museum is a runner.